شتان بين فتاة دين آمنت وفتاة دين من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهج هج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار عبار الله Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome and brothers and sisters to another class on the biography of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, his life and times. And uh, today, inshallah, we're going to start off with a quiz from the class that we did last week. Uh, last week, we just went through an introduction to Omar radiallahu anhu and his life and times and we talked about um, why we should want to learn more about the lives of the Sahaba, of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and um, we talked about uh, Omar's life in Makkah uh, we discussed his name, his lineage and nicknames, his birth, his physical characteristics, his family wives, sons and daughters. Okay, so um, let's start off just by going to the quiz, the first slide there. And um, the first question is, what did Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu mean when he said, follow those who have died? What did Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu mean when he said follow those who have died <clears throat> okay mashallah very good We've got answers on the screen there the first one he means following those early generations of Sahaba who already have died because they passed all their trials with strong faith as good examples for us but those who are still living may fail their trials due to their faith and the next answer on the screen there we should follow the companions of the Prophet وسلم, who are dead because they passed their trials and should be a role model and not follow the people living because they might not pass some of their trials very good and the last answer there he was talking about the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whom should be followed they were most blessed and guided people of this nation okay well done okay so Abdullah bin Mas'ud he was talking to the Tabi'in the second generation of Muslims so he said whoever would like to follow the way of someone let him follow the way of those who have died for those who are still living are not safe from fitna or trials and those who have died of course are the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he was telling here that Tabi'in follow the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam don't follow the way of the living among you even though they might be very pious and very close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and be allies and friends of Allah some of them may be very virtuous but Abdullah bin Mas'ud he's saying here don't follow the life of the living among you but follow the dead the companions of the Prophet because it's just possible that 
this living person you are following might fail in some of his trials. Whereas the difference is with the Sahaba, the companions, radiallahu anhum, they passed all of their trials. But anyone who's living with you now in the second generation, you don't know what his outcome might be. Because the Prophet says there are some people who would be following the way of the people of Jannah, of Paradise, in their actions. They're doing what the people of Jannah do, but before they die, they may commit the actions of the people of Hellfire and end up going into the Hellfire. So everyone is going to be faced with trials, but nobody knows what the outcome will be. Next question. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, he went on to describe good qualities which the companions possessed. Who can tell us some of those good qualities? MashaAllah, very quick answers there. Okay, on the screen we've got, they are the most pious at heart. They have good manners, adhering to the Prophet Sunnah and the way of the rightly guided. They are sim simplicity without being polluted. They have the deepest knowledge and the, they are the least superficial. They are stern and harsh with the disbelievers and they are merciful, compassionate and soft with the believers. And the other answers on the screen there, he said they had the deepest knowledge of Islam, they had the most pious hearts, and they were the least superficial of all people. And the next one there, they were the best of the summa, they were the purest of, of it in heart, and the deepest of it in knowledge. MashaAllah, well done. Okay, so they, the Sahaba, the companions, they were the best of this ummah, because the Prophet وسلم, says, the best of generations is my generation. And they had all of those other qualities which you've mentioned there. So these are the people whom Allah chose to be the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and to establish his deen. Go on to the next question. True or false, when the companions of Allah's Messenger وسلم, embraced Islam, their hearts had to be cleansed first. Is this true or false? When the companions of Allah's Messenger وسلم, embraced Islam, their hearts had to be cleansed first. Very good, the answer is false. And um, we went into some detail over this point last week. So that when the companions, when the Sahab, when they accepted Islam, for them to practice Islam was easy because the Quran, it didn't have to compete with conflicting ideologies and contradictory values and lifestyles. The Arabs from the Arabian Peninsula, they were very simple people with a very simple religion which was just mixed up with a few moral values and that's it. But with the other nations further away, the Quran had to cleanse their hearts first. It had to heal the scars that were left behind by their old lifestyles because the nat natural disposition of the people was deformed by all kinds of uh, external influences like the philosophy of the Greeks religious teachings of other nations like the Romans and so on. Okay, so on to another question dealing with uh, Omar's early life in Mecca. What quality was unique about Omar ibn al-Khattab compared to other companions of the Prophet وسلم? What quality was unique about Umar ibn al-Khattab compared to the other companions of the Prophet MashaAllah, very good. Uh, answer on the screen there. One of his unique qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with was the truth on his tongue and in his heart. Also he is very strong and firm in his faith 
that even shaitan was not able to deceive him and get to his heart. Okay, very good points there that we um, talked about a lot last week. But if there's one word which could describe his uniqueness, I would choose the word personality. Um, with Abu Bakr as Sadiq, it was his Iman which stood out. But with Umar ibn al-Khattab, he had a personality which was unrivaled. And as you've mentioned correctly in the answer there, the truth naturally flowed on his tongue. And his intuition was always right. And we'll talk more about that today. And this is why Umar ibn al-Khattab is special. And that's why we should follow the way of Umar ibn al-Khattab because he is the man who recognized the truth and spoke and acted upon it. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed the truth on the tongue of Umar ibn al-Khattab and in his heart. And the Prophet وسلم, also said, if there was going to be a prophet after me, he would have been Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar had so many virtues and also he had many attributes of the prophets in him that if there were to be a prophet in this ummah after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have chosen Umar. And he would be most similar to Prophet Musa alayhi salam, a prophet of strength. Okay, so well down there and um, on to the next question. What is Umar's full name? What is Omar's full name? Okay, well done. The correct answers are on the screen there. Omar ibn al-Khattab, Ibn Nufail, Ibn Abdullah Uzza. Okay, so his father was al-Khattab, Ibn Nufail, and his grandfather was Nufail, Ibn Abdullah Uzza. And what was his mother's name? What was Omar's mother's name? MashaAllah, well done, the correct answer is there. His mother was Hantama bint Hashim ibn Mughira. And next question, how many wives did he have and what are their names? How many wives did Omar have and what are their names? MashaAllah, well done. There's answers on the screen there. He had he had seven or eight wives. Um, They were Zainab, Malika bint Jarwal, Quraiba, Um Hakim, Jamila bint Asim, Atika bint Zaid, Um Kulthum bint Ali bin Abi Talib. Okay. On to another question. How many children did Omar have and what were their names? MashaAllah, well done there. All good answers on the screen there. And uh, there were 13 children in all. Their names were Zaid the Elder and Zaid the Younger. Uh, and of course Zaid was the name of Omar's brother he loved him very much but he died in battle so he called two of his two of his sons after his brother there was also asim abdullah abdurrahman the elder abdurrahman the middle one and abdurrahman the younger one so another name he loved very much also ubaidullah ayab hafsa ruqayya zainab and fatima mashallah well done with the answers there 
Okay, that's the quiz. So let's go on to today's class. And inshallah, today we're going to talk about Omar's life during the Jahiliya, the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. We'll go on to talk about his determination to kill the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we'll talk about his becoming Muslim. As for his life during the Jahiliya, Umar radiallahu anhu spent half of his life in Jahiliya and he grew up like his peers in the Quraysh, except he had an advantage over them because he was one of the few people who learned how to read. He bore the responsibility at an early age and he had a very harsh upbringing in which he knew no type of luxury or manifestation of wealth. His father, Al Khattab, forced him to tend his camels. His father's harsh treatment had a negative effect on, on Omar, which he remembered for all of his life. Abdurrahman bin Hatib spoke of that and he said, I was with Omar ibn al-Khattab in Dajnan and he said, I used to tend the livestock for al-Khattab in this place and he was very harsh. Sometimes I would tend the livestock and sometimes I would gather firewood. So this was a period of hardship during Omar's life and he would often remember it. Saeed ibn al-Musayyab tells us Omar went for Hajj and when he was in Dajnan he said, There is no God but Allah Ta'ala, the Most High, the Most Great, the one who gives whatever he wills to whomever he wills. I used to tend the camels of al-Khattab in this valley wearing a woolen garment. He was harsh. He would exhaust me when I worked and beat me if I fell short. And now here I am with no one between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was Omar when he was the Khalifa of the Muslims, the highest authority when he was describing his early life. There is no one in between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Omar here, he was saying, there was a day when I was a shepherd for my father. And he would beat me up, he would hit me, and he was very harsh with me. And now look where I am. But when you say, La ilaha illallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives whatever he wants to whoever he wants. Who would imagine the Khalifa of the Muslims would be Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, the shepherd of yesterday. Umar did not tend livestock for his father only, rather, he used to tend the livestock of his maternal aunts of Banu Makhzum tribe. And this was narrated to us from Umar himself when he was pondering one day the fact that he had become the Khalifa. So who could be better than him? But in order to remind himself of what he was, as he thought, he stood before the Muslims and announced that he was no more than a shepherd who used to tend the flocks of his maternal aunts of Banu Makhzum. Muhammad ibn Umar al-Makhzumi narrated that his father said, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu called out that prayer was about to begin. And when the people had gathered, he ascended the member and praised and glorified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he deserves and sent blessings and peace upon his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he said, O oh people, I remember when I used to tend the flocks of my maternal aunts of Banu Makhzum and they would give me a handful of dates or raisins which would be sufficient for the day and what a miserable day that was. He had a miserable day and what that meant was he worked for the entire day and that was what he got at the end of the day, just a handful of dates and that's how poor he was at that time. Then he came down from the member and Abdurrahman bin Auf said to him, O oh, Amir al-Mu'minin, all you did was belittle yourself in front of everyone. What did you mean by this khutbah? Umar radiallahu anhu said, Woe to you, O oh, oh son of Auf. I was alone and I started to think. I said to myself, You are the Khalifa, who is better than you? So I wanted to remind myself of what I am. 
So Omar was saying, my nafs, my soul that was telling me that you are Amir al-Mu'minin, the commander of the faithful, so who is better than you? So I wanted to teach myself a lesson and let it know who it is. I wanted myself to know who it really is and how humble it is because myself was trying to play games on me and was trying to tell me that I am Amir al-Mu'minin and who is better than me? Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu he cannot be fooled by anyone, even his own self. So you see here, his self was trying to play games with him and was telling him that you are the best. Look who you are. But shaitan cannot come to you unless you allow him to do so, unless you invite him in. And on the day of judgment, the people would go to the shaitan and complain. And shaitan would say, I have no authority over you. You're the one who committed sins. I didn't ask you to do, to do bad deeds. You did them yourself. So shaitan will be in denial. And shaitan, he cannot have access to your heart unless you give him the keys. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he was closing all of the doors which would allow shaitan to come in. But as for us today, we flung all of the doors wide open. The doors of our hearts are wide open to shaitan. Welcome, come on in. Shaitan cannot come to you unless you allow him to do so. And when he went to Adam alayhi salam in Jannah, what did he tell Adam? Did he tell him to go and eat from the tree that Allah has banned? Go and eat from the tree that is haram? Go and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, he was cunning. So, he told him, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Ya Adamu Hal Adulluka Ala Shajriti Lukhuldika Wal Mulki La Yabla Oh Adam, I'm going to tell you about a tree that would give you everlasting life and a great kingdom. Shaitan knows what appeals to our hearts. You want to live forever? You want to have power? So these are the doors in which he came in the heart of Adam alayhi salam. So shaitan needed to find the way to enter. But Umar ibn al-Khattab, he sealed all the entrances and he shut them. Umar radiallahu anhu says, I am not a deceiver, nor will I allow anybody to deceive me. I don't go around by deceiving people, but at the same time, no one can deceive me. And this is why the Prophet wasallam said, whenever shaitan sees Umar following one road, shaitan would take another road. So shaitan has given up on Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. There's no hope. There's just no way of getting to him, so it's a waste of time. And this is why when we're going through the story of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, we reflect a lot on his sayings and his actions because it tells you a great deal about his personality. Undoubtedly his job tending livestock, which was the constant work of Umar in Mecca before he entered Islam, caused him to acquire good characteristics such as forbearance, patience and toughness. But tending sheep wasn't the only work that he did during, during this period of Jahiliya. From his early youth, he also excelled in all kinds of sports, such as wrestling, riding, and horsemanship. And as a wrestler, he used to join in competitions, and he was unbeatable. He enjoyed and narrated poetry, and he was interested in the history and affairs of his people. He was keen to attend the great fears of the Arabs, such as Al-Qadh, Mijanna, and Dhul Majaz, where he would make the most of the opportunity to engage in trade and learn the history of the Arabs and the battles and contests that had taken place among the Arabs. Arab literature was discussed at these events in front of prominent figures from the tribes, which meant that Arab history was constantly being discussed and was unlikely to be forgotten. And sometimes these literary contests would spark wars. And Al-Qadh itself, it was a direct cause of four wars which were known as the Wars of Al-Fujar. His first profession was being a shepherd for his father and for his aunts. And then he started a business and he was very successful at it. 
Omar engaged in trade and profited, which made him one of the rich men of Makkah. He became acquainted with many people in the lands that he visited for the purposes of trade. He travelled to Syria in the summer and Yemen in the winter. He occupied a prominent position in Makkan society during the Jahidiyyah and played an effective role in shaping events. He was helped by the outstanding history of his forefathers. His grandfather, Nufail ibn Abdul Uzza, was one to whom the Quraysh referred their disputes for judgment. And his ancestor, Ka'ab ibn Lu'ay, was held in the high esteem by the Arabs. They had recorded their history from the year of his death until the year of the elephant. Omar inherited the status from his forefathers, which brought him a great deal of knowledge about the life and circumstances of the Arabs, in addition to his own smartness and intelligence. So they would come to him to resolve their disputes. Ibn Sa'ad said, Omar used to judge between the Arabs regarding their disputes before Islam. Omar was wise, eloquent, well-spoken, strong, forbearing, noble, persuasive, and of clear speech, which made him qualified to be an ambassador for the Quraysh to speak up for them before the other tribes. Ibn al-Jawzi said, the role of ambassador fell to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. If there was a war between the Quraysh and another tribe, they would send him as an ambassador. And if another tribe was boasting against them, they would send him to respond in kind, and they were pleased with him. He used to defend all the traditions, acts of worship, and systems to which the Quraysh were accustomed. His nature was one of sincerity which led him to defend all that he believed in to the bitter end. In Jahiliya, because of the nature of Omar, he was not a person who would do something half-heartedly. He would always put his full effort into everything. He was very committed, a very committed and disciplined person, and he acted upon what he believed. He didn't sit on the sideline watching others. He always got involved. So therefore, in Jahiliya, he was one of the most effective men of the Quraysh in the Inquisition against the Muslims. He was one of the toughest in his persecution of the Muslims, because the, that's the nature of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He went full ahead with what he believed in. He was never a spectator watching on. So Umar resisted Islam in the beginning because he feared that this new religion would shake the system that was well established in Mecca and which gave Mecca a special status amongst the Arabs. For it was the location of the house to which people came on pilgrimage, which gave the Quraysh a unique status amongst the Arabs and brought spiritual and material wealth to Mecca. And this was the reason for the city's prosperity and its people's wealth. And so the rich men of Mecca resisted this religion and persecuted the weak amongst its converts. And Umar radiallahu anhu was at the forefront of those who persecuted these weak ones. He kept on beating a slave in one incident, a slave woman who had become Muslim until his arms grew tired and the whip fell from his hand. Then he stopped to rest. And what did he tell her? Listen, I didn't stop because I feel sorry for you. I stopped because I'm tired. She responded back and she said, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made you stop. And that was the iman of the slave. And it was unacceptable to the minds of many of the Muslims that one day Omar could become a Muslim himself. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq then passed by and he saw how the slave woman was being tortured and so he bought her from him and set her free. Omar lived during the Jahiliya and he knew it inside out. He knew its true nature, its customs and traditions, and he defended it with all the strength that he possessed. So when he entered Islam, he understood its beauty and true nature, and he understood the great difference between the guidance and misguidance, between disbelief or kufr and faith, truth and falsehood. And so he spoke the famous words, the bonds of Islam, will be undone one by one when there will be a generation brought up in Islam who do not know what Jahiliya is.
Omar is becoming a Muslim. The first ray of light of faith that touched Omar's heart came on the day when he saw the women of Quraysh leaving their homeland and traveling to a distant land because of the persecution that they were facing from him and others like him. His conscience was stirred. He felt remorse and pity for them. And he spoke kind words to them which they had never expected to hear from somebody like him. Um Abdullah bin Hantama said, When we were traveling, migrating to Abyssinia, Omar, who used to persecute us mercilessly, came and stood over me and said to me, Are you leaving, O Um Abdullah? I said, Yes. You have persecuted us and oppressed us, and by Allah Ta'ala we are going to travel in the land of Allah Ta'ala in order that we can practice our religion freely. Omar said, May Allah Ta'ala be with you. And I saw a kindness in him that I'd never seen before. This statement was contrary to the nature of Omar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhum. Omar showing compassion to a Muslim. Omar was moved by this woman's attitude and he felt distressed. So much suffering the followers of this new religion were putting up with, but despite that, they were standing firm. So what was that secret behind this extraordinary strength? He felt sad and he was filled with pain. When Amir ibn Rabi'a, who had gone out on some errand, came back, Umm Abdullah told him about that and he asked, It seems that you hope Umar will become Muslim. She said, Yes. He said, his father's donkey will become a Muslim before Omar does. So Amir is telling the woman, yes, go along with your emotions, but Omar ibn al-Khattab, he will never become a Muslim. But she was right, and he was wrong. And this is to show they didn't see it possible that one day this man would become a Muslim. But hidayah, or guidance, is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You never know who's going to embrace Islam. And shortly after this incident, Umar became Muslim because of the dua of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was the main reason for his becoming Muslim. He had prayed for him saying, O oh Allah Ta'ala, support Islam with the more beloved of these two men to you, Abu Jahl ibn Hisham or Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the more beloved of them to him was Umar radiallahu anhu. How did he become Muslim? There was one incident that was narrated by his son Abdullah and he said, One day a handsome man walked in front of us, so my father looked at him. He looked at his face and said, If my intuition is right, this man was a kahin, a fortune teller for his people. And this is what you call farasa. Farasa is the art of reading the face. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he had that ability. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you just look into the face of somebody and you can read their personality. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he was very good at farasa, the reading of faces. So by just looking at the face of this man that he'd never met before, he read his face and he said, this man used to be a fortune teller for his people. So they called the man. The man said, I've never seen something like this before. And the man was amazed at Omar's ability. And for Asa, the reading of the faces was seen as an art. It's a kind of art which is taught and it appears in different cultures and different versions of reading the face. But Rasulullah said, Beware the farasa, the reading of faces of the believer, because he can see by the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a gift which is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to certain people, and Umar ibn al-Khattab had this gift. So Umar, he called the man and told him to tell him about himself. The man said, yes, I was a fortune teller of my people. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhumah said, Really would the intuition of my father be wrong? It was always on target. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu asked the man, 
tell me the strangest thing that your female jinn told you. Because these are the ones that the fortune tellers deal with. They deal with the jinn. So Omar is asking the man about the strangest thing that the man heard from his jinn. And the man said, so my jinn came to me and he spoke some rhyming words. He also spoke about the coming of a prophet. Umar ibn al-Khattab confirmed that and he said, yes, that's true. One day the man was sacrificing for the idols next to the Kaaba and I heard a very loud voice and this voice was saying something similar, that there is a prophet coming. Then Umar said immediately after that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam claimed to be a prophet. So all of these things, they were hints that were coming to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu to prepare him, to prepare him for Islam. And this is what happened in the beginning. And there were two incidents which led to his conversion to Islam. First, his determination to kill the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And second, there was Umar's raid on his sister's house, Fatima bint al-Khattab and her steadfastness in front of Umar, her brother. So by this stage, Umar was getting closer to Islam. His stance was changing and his heart was beginning to soften. Then one day, while the mushrikeen were discussing how to deal with the problem of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they said, who will volunteer to kill him? Umar radiallahu anhu said, I will. They said, good, you're the one for the job. So Omar, he carried his sword in the middle of a very hot day in Makkah. He was walking down the streets towards Dar al-Arqam, and he was told that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was meeting his companions there. And this was after many of the Sahaba already made hijrah to Abyssinia. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was left with just a small group of companions, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Abu Bakr as siddiq and a few others. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was heading through the streets of Mecca and he had evil in his eyes. One of the companions who was practicing Islam in secret, he saw Umar and he realized that something was wrong. So he asked him, where are you heading? Umar said, to this man who has disunited our people and who has made fools out of us and who has cursed our gods, I'm going to kill him. So the companion told him, it seems that you're too confident in yourself. You think that Banu Abdul Manaf, family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are going to let you walk on the face of this earth after you've killed their man? And this is what happens in the tribal system. Omar was upset so they started an argument and then Umar ibn al-Khattab told this man and he said I think you've become a Muslim I'm sure if you have become a Muslim I'm going to start by killing you first and the whole reason why this Sahabi was discussing with Umar ibn al-Khattab was because he wanted to divert him from his objective and the companion felt that he wanted to save Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he felt that there was no hope, he carried on a discussion with Umar. And in this way, he told Umar, well, before you go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why don't you go and take care of your own household first? Umar said, what do you mean by that? He said, your sister and her husband have become Muslims. So this Sahabi said, this, though, when every other argument didn't work. The sister of Umar was Muslim in secret, and so was her husband, Saeed ibn Zaid. And what the companion did was put the sister of Umar and her husband in big trouble by exposing them. But why would he do that? He did that to save Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now Umar ibn al-Khattab, he changed his course and he went straight to the house of his sister. He got next to the door and he heard them reciting the Quran. Fatima bint al-Khattab and her husband Saeed bin Zaid. Saeed is the cousin of Umar ibn al-Khattab and he's 
one of the ten who were given the glad tidings of paradise, and they were being taught Quran by Khabbab ibn al Arat. When he knocked at the door and he saw that it was Omar, Khabbab ibn al Arat immediately went into hiding, and Fatima hid the pages of the Quran under her thigh. Omar came in and he said, What was that humming sound I heard? They said, It was nothing, we were just talking. He said, Don't lie to me. What was that noise, and have you become Muslims? Sa'id ibn Zayd said, Well, what if Islam is better than your religion? At that point, Umar ibn Khattab attacked Sa'id ibn Zayd. He threw him to the ground, and then he sat on top of him. When Fatima saw that, she came to defend her husband. Umar struck her on the face, and she started to bleed. She then said, You enemy of Allah Ta'ala, you hit me just because I believed in Allah. Whether you like it or not, I bear witness and I testify that there is no God but Allah Ta'ala and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah. Do whatever you want. When Umar, when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu saw this strength emanating from his sister and this confidence and he saw the blood on her face, he regretted what he did because it was unacceptable in their custom to hit a woman in such a manner. So he felt sorry for what he did to his sister. Then he moved away from Saeed and sat down and he said, Give me those papers. She said, I won't. Omar said, What you said has struck a chord in my heart and I promise you that I will return the papers to you safely. She said, You are a mushrik and you are in a state of impurity so you must have ghusl first. Umar ibn al-Khattab went and he made ghusl, he bathed himself, then she gave him the papers. Umar radiallahu anhu started to recite the verses. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'ana litashqa illa tazkirata liman yakhsha. تنزيلا ممن خلق الأرض والسماوات العلى الرحمن على العرش استوى له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وما بينهما وما تحت الثرى وإن تجهر بالقول فإنه يعلم السر وأخفى الله لا إله إلا هو له الأسماء الحسنى Taha, we have not sent down to you the Qur'an that you be distressed, but only as a reminder for those who fear Allah, a revelation from He who created the earth and highest heavens, the most merciful who is above the throne established. To Him belongs what is in the heavens and what is on the earth and what is between them and what is under the soil. And if you speak aloud, then indeed he knows the secret and what is even more hidden. Allah, there is no deity except him. To him belong the best names. When Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu recited these verses, he said, Is this what the Quraysh was against? The one who has spoken these words needs to be worshipped. Where is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They told him where Muhammad was meeting the Sahaba and Umar, he went to Dar al-Arqam and he knocked on the door. The Sahaba peeked and saw that it's Umar ibn al-Khattab and so they all sat down. Hamza looked at them and asked, what's wrong with you? They said it's Umar ibn al-Khattab. So what did Hamza reply? He said, so what if it's Umar? But nobody wanted to open the door, no one wanted to deal with Umar ibn al-Khattab, but Hamza was the one who could handle that. He was like the knight of the Quraysh. He said, so what if it's Umar ibn al-Khattab? If he came for good, then he's welcome. If he came for evil, then we'll kill him with his own sword. Because Umar had his sword hanging around his neck. Hamza opened the door and they, he and another companion held Umar by his arms and they brought him to the Prophet wasallam, who said, leave him alone. So Hamza and the other companion left Umar 
And now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though he was shorter than Umar, grabbed Umar by his clothes and pulled him towards himself, saying, Why did you come here, son of Khattab? Aren't you going to stop fighting Islam until Allah Ta'ala destroys you? Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have come here for no other reason than believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made takbir, Allahu Akbar. None of the other Sahaba were there to see what was happening, they were hiding. Then when they heard the takbir of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the whole place erupted in takbir. And they couldn't believe it. And it was so loud that they had to immediately disperse because everybody else could hear. When Khabbab radiallahu anhu heard that, he came out of the house where he had been hiding and he said, Be of good cheer, O Umar, for I hope that this is the answer to the dua of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which he spoke on Monday. He said, O oh Allah Ta'ala, support Islam with the one of these two men who is more beloved to you. Abu Jahl ibn Hisham or Umar ibn al-Khattab. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made this dua, O oh Allah Ta'ala, honor Islam with one of the two, the one whom you love most, Abu Jahl or Umar. Why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam make dua specific for these two men? Because their strength would turn into strength for Islam. Abu Jahl, he was a leader of his people and he was a very wise man. And people, they have this impression of Abu Jahl being a monster, but he was a strong man who was a straightforward person and he was committed to his objectives. He was a hard worker and he was very wise and intelligent. So people, they gave him a name and his real name is Umar ibn Hisham. His name, real name isn't Abu Jahl, but his real name is Umar ibn, ibn Hisham. But because of his wisdom, he was given the name Abu Hakam, the father of wisdom. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave him the name Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance. Why? Because no matter how wise you are, no matter how intelligent you are, if your intelligence doesn't lead you towards Islam, then your intelligence is of no benefit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَوْا أَوْ نَعْقِنُوا مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ And they will say, if only we had been listening or reasoning, we would not be among the companions of the blazing fire. And so the Prophet ﷺ gave him the name Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua of the Prophet ﷺ and chose Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Also there's another incident that happened with Umar and that also brought him closer to Islam. One night he decided as there was nothing else to do, why not go and make tawaf of the Kaaba? So he went to the Kaaba and it was late at night when there were no people about and who did he see there? He saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was praying. This late hour when everybody else was asleep, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was standing in front of the Kaaba making ruku' and sujood. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he thought, well, why don't I strike fear in the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because it's me and him alone. So what he does, he goes behind the Kaaba so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can't see him and he slides in between the Kaaba and the cloth covering it. Then he began to sneak around the Kaaba so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam couldn't see him until he made it right in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he couldn't see him because he was still hiding behind the cloth of the Kaaba. So what Umar ibn al-Khattab wanted to do was to ambush the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But then he got into hearing range of the verses of the Qur'an which he was reciting. 
And at that time, the people of the Quraysh, they used to intentionally block their ears so they couldn't hear the Qur'an being recited. But now Umar was right there within range. Umar ibn al-Khattab is listening attentively to the verses of Qur'an. And Umar said to himself, these must be words of a poet, such wonderful words. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was reciting the chapter Surah Al-Haqqah. And the next verse after this, it was exactly what Umar was thinking. وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرْ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ These are not the words of a poet, but little did you believe. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he was, he was absolutely shocked and he immediately said, then these must be words of a kahin, a fortune teller. How did he know it was in my heart? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنْ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ These are not the words of a fortune teller. Little do you remember. Umar ibn al-Khattab just about froze in his tracks thinking, these must be the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you.